Hello everyone. Welcome to another VWO webinar. My name is Utkarsh Rai and I take up growth marketing initiatives at VWO. I'll be moderating today's session. For this session, we are excited to host two of our known customers, BrainShark and Quandu. First, we have Erica Schroeder, who is a web manager at BrainShark. BrainShark is a sales enablement software which has businesses with training, coaching, and provide content solutions to achieve sales mastery. Second, we have Pablo Paternain, who is a senior product owner at Quandu for B2C web. Quandu is a restaurant table booking and review website, which helps its user to book a table with more than 17,000 restaurants across the world. Joining them for this session, we have Rahul Jain from VW's product marketing team. We welcome you guys. In this session, we are discussing ways to gather data around website visitor and how you can leverage it to significantly impact your conversion rate. So to just give a brief about the flow of this presentation, Rahul from the VW product team will be discussing about methods of visitor research, uh, how we can best utilize the tools and techniques uh, and how we can best utilize them. Then we have an in webinar activity planned for you guys, which will be basically to sketch your visitor journey. It will help you in creating a tailored visitor research blueprint for your business. And then we'll simply jump into action on how successful businesses like BrainShark and Condu consume and interpret visitor data and put it to work to improve their website conversion rates. So before we begin, uh, for any questions you have, you can reach out to me on Twitter with today's hashtag, hashtag AskVWO. You can also use GoToWebinar's question widget to ask us anything. We'll take your questions at the end of the session. So let's begin. I would request Rahul to take it over from here. Rahul, over to you. Thanks a lot uh, for the introduction, Utkarsh, and welcome everyone. I'm excited to see you all here today and would love to chat more and hear more about your research efforts post my session. So uh, before we essentially deep dive into uh, uh, you know, research, uh, you know, I would just like you to walk you through the initial steps that are required for conversion rate optimization process. So all of us understand that, you know, uh, main goal of any website is to provide the best experience to the users so that you can, you know, help the users purchase a product or, you know, whatever your main goal is. For that, you know, a CRO process works as a guiding line wherein you know it helps you do more data driven testing and helps you understand your visitors so a typical conversion optimization process starts with understanding what the user is doing on the website and what are the problem areas on the website in research phase we try to find out what is wrong by defining the business goals and funnels and why is it wrong by looking at or you know by visualizing the user journey once we have observations we use that data in hypothesis phase. So in this phase, we define the problem and the solution, which is obviously based on our research. In the next phase, once we have a backlog of ideas, we prioritize them based on different criteria, such as confidence, importance, and ease of implementation. Once we have a prioritized list of ideas, we test them against the existing version of the website. And finally, in the learning phase, we deploy winners hypothesis and gaining learnings from the subsequent test as well. So in this webinar, we will deep dive into research phase and understand various research methods, practical use cases, and best ways to get maximum outputs with minimum inputs. So first up, you know, we'll, we'll discuss the various research methods available in the market. So broadly, you know, uh, Research is divided into four sort of phases. One is the quantitative methods. The other one is qualitative methods. Then we have technical and then heuristic methods. So most of you are already aware of, you know, all these techniques, but for newcomers in the industry, let me take a couple of minutes to explain these categories and different ways to conduct visitor research. First up, we have quantitative methods. Quantitative techniques are those which involve collecting metrics about users on how they interact and engage with your website. 
these metrics or numbers are later used to understand the visitor behavior. The most common example of quantitative technique is gathering analytics from simple metrics like number of sessions, bounce rate, time spent on the page to conversion focused metrics like measuring how, how many users clicked on CTA button or filled out a demo form. If you want to optimize your website, it is important to measure conversion focused metrics that we call it as goals and events. These objectives define the success or failure of your optimization program. So advanced practitioners also adapt conversion funnel tracking as a part of quantitative research, where they track how many users are following or rather dropping from the primary pathway. For example, uh, tracking by a journey from search base to checkout for e-commerce. Another way to collect quantitative data is form analytics. So basically form analytics is under, uh, used to understand how your users are interacting with different elements of your form. This really helps you optimize the form and it feeds to maximum form summits. All these, all these quantified data points are easy to interpret. And of course, data can't lie, right? However, is it enough to define customer needs? I don't think so. So let's take a quick example here. So for instance, I see, let's say I see a 30% drop off from card page to checkout page. Now, do we exactly know why those 30% people are dropping off? What could be the potential reason? Is the customer distracted because of some offer running on the website? Or are we forcing him to create an account? Or there could be multiple reasons but every website is different and all of the above could be one of the reasons, but we cannot be sure which one is true. So, you know, as they say that, you know, quantitative data shows you what is happening on the website, but why is it happen is discovered by qualitative tools. So uh, now to uncover the exact reason for a visitor dropping off, we use qualitative techniques. Qualitative techniques involve collecting visitor behavior data that we can be, that can be visualized for better analysis of customer journey. Some of the popular qualitative tools are heat maps, click maps, customer interviews, surveys, session replays, click testing, etc. Our friends from Brainshark and Kondu will talk about their success stories using this methods later in the webinar. So now talking about technical research and heuristic analysis, technical research is essentially discovering the broken functionality and the user experience on the website. It is somewhat interesting. We call it low hanging fruits. Anyone can do it. You don't require special tools and it's added and it instantly gives you results to fix without much efforts. All you need is to find what browsers and devices or users are using and compare conversion rates among them. If you notice a drastic drop, it means that your site is not optimized for that technical configuration. For example, some parts of your website might not be optimized for different browsers. Again, combining technical research with qualitative techniques, you can figure out which parts of website are users struggling with on different browsers. Lastly, we have heuristic analysis. To explain this in simple terms, a subject matter expert anal analyzes the website or, or a web page and provides recommendation and best practices to follow based on their experiences. Though we don't count opinions when it comes to science of visitor research, but heuristic research has proved to be an effective method to discover pain points that randomly sharing some ideas. The main advantage of heuristic analysis is that it can be done in really short time frame. The results might not be far reaching, but are good enough to be optimal. So we have talked about so many ways of conducting visitor research, but now the challenge is to choose a research tool that gives maximum insights with minimum effort. Although it is never advisable to use a single technique in silos, but if you're just beginning with user research, it is advisable to start with a simple tool that could give you maximum insights. We will talk about ways in which you could leverage multiple capabilities together to gain maximum insights. To, the answer, to answer to which tools to use, we conducted a survey with CRO experts and found that heat maps are the easiest methods 
or use this tool to generate insights and the value of insights generated is good enough. Web analytics, when set up properly, can tell you about every aspect of website and insights are incredibly high. Service, form analytics and session replays could be a little difficult when it comes to digging insights, but they tell you insights that no other tool can tell. And the value of these insights are amazing. Card sorting, five second test should be the last resorts for generating insights. So the first quadrants are the tools which you should aim for. Now we have discussed so many methods and tools to you know do research, but the inherent problem with all these is how should we approach it? We have all the data sitting in our systems. We have multiple tools available at hand, but what should be the starting point? This is something that you know we heard we hear a lot from our customers because they always tell us that you know hey your tool is great you give us so many insights but you know where should we start how should we structure our visitor research so let's talk about how to set up a research blueprint so these are the three pillars that would instantly get you started with your visitor research let us deep dive into all of these one mistake that most people do is called a plus research. One might get fascinated looking at fancy heat maps and recordings, and they might find even something interesting in them, but we will never be able to translate them into a hypothesis if we do not follow a structured process. First step to do research is to have a goal. Defining our business goal is a starting point. You should clearly know that you know what are the most important actions that you want user to take. So defining the goal and tracking it is the most important step. Thus, the CRO process should begin by establishing a baseline measurement, which you can do using the analytics tool. You should know what your current conversion rates are, and then you should aim to improve these conversion rates. To set up these baseline measurements, you need to set up metrics that reflect the success of your optimization program. Now, what could be these metrics? It depends primarily on the nature of your business, but sales are often the best indicator. To measure sales, you can start measuring supporting indicators like lead contact form filled or clicks on a demo button or number of promotional videos viewed. For example, a macro conversion is increasing revenue for an e-commerce site. So a user should first create a revenue goal or payment form submission goal. Now the macro conversions, the micro conversions are the goals that support macro conversions, like visits to product page, which has add, add to cart button or clicks on add to cart button. Users should now analyze the behavior of their customers at pages related to micro conversions and deploy experiments to improve micro and then macro conversions. You should also set up funnels for most parts that your users follow and see and understand where they drop off. So essentially to summarize, you know, there are two, two types of goals. One is the macro goal, one is the micro goal. And it's really important that you have that macro goal in mind. You should know where you need to go. The second part here is the funnels. You can now record website metrics on your landing page, e-commerce shop or travel website, and then measure these as goals with funnels. You can identify and set up conversion funnels to know your, where your visitors are dropping off. After you've documented your baseline, it is time to start research and identifying obstacles your visitors need to overcome to become customers. So later in the webinar, Utkash will help you define the user journey. Finally, now that we have set up our goals, we have used those goals in our business funnels, now the next question is that you know hey let's say a lot of visitors are dropping off from product page to cart page so this is a big group how do i now research about these particular visitors now there's this interesting concept called visitor profiles so every user has a certain characteristic so what exactly do i mean when i say visitor profile so until now the most common metric that people track is visitors 
who converted versus visitors who did not convert. But the amount of people that fall under both the categories is huge. And it is virtually impossible to understand the user behavior if we just limit ourselves to categorizing all the users in the above category. So every user who does not purchase might have a different set of characteristics or behavior that they exhibit for diff different sort of needs that they have. So let's take an example of a confused user. So when I talk about a confused user, he might come to a product and be very confused. So an average user who spends a 15, 15 minutes time on the website, but as compared to the average visitors, a confused visitor will spend only 30 seconds. Similarly, the number of pages viewed by this visitor would be less than the average visitor. So if you account for all these characteristics such as session time, number of pages viewed, time before first click, time spent per page, and combining these attributes, you can easily create your visitor profiles or personas. Not only will they help you understand what a confused user is doing on the website or what a loyal visitor is doing on the website, it will also help you categorize and break down your research. Similarly, you know, let's say a visitor comes to your website and he's trying to search for a product and he's not able to search the product. He, is, he has used your menu, he has used your search, but ultimately is not able to get it. He'll be frustrated. He'll click everywhere on the website and his session time would be smaller. He'll get frustrated and ultimately he'll leave your website. So again, if you use that characteristics such as session time, and number of clicks per page, an average visitor would ideally maybe spend 15 minutes, but a frustrated user would spend only eight minutes. Similarly, a uh, average user might, you know, might, you know, click five times on the particular page, but a frustrated user might click 10 times. So idea is to combine all these sort of behaviors and compare it with your average visitor. This way you can create all the different profiles of your visitors and help and it will really help you do your research. So uh, this way, you know, we have defined the entire sort of a process wherein you define your goal. You make that goal a part of the funnel and then deep dive into individual user, which you categorize under different profiles. So next up, we have Utkarsh who will be talking about practical examples of how you can build this visitor journey. Over to you, Utkarsh. Thanks, Rahul. So guys, so far we discussed about in a, in a pursuit of building a research blueprint, we discussed about goals, which is basically baselining your metrics for measurement. We discussed about funnels, which are basically identify areas of visitor drop off from your web website experience. And then we discussed about visitor profiles, which is basically a segmentation of your visitors on the basis of quantitative, quant uh, quantitative data. Just, just, just a moment. Yeah. So keeping all these three components of uh, research group in mind, the best way uh, we can keep the all the three components in action is by drawing a visitor journey. A visitor journey is the set of experiences or action your visitor takes on your website. It could be something as simple as landing on your website and simply simply clicking on your free trial button and converting. Or it could be something as complicated as tunneling through multiple category pages and then reaching to a product page and then checking out. So putting uh, these three components into action, let's try to understand a visitor journey through an example. So here we have an example of an e-commerce website. As you can see the visitor journey, it's very straightforward. Uh, I'm assuming all of you guys have at some point of time in your life would have, have the e-commerce website experience. So visitors ideally on an e-commerce website have something to purchase on mine or they're just doing window shopping there. So once you land on the website, you see a mega menu where basically, which has which categorizes different products and segment different things. Then the visitor usually apply different filters on that website to shortlist a product. Then they simply land on the pro product page, do, do a little bit of research around the product, whether in terms of whether the shipment is all right, what is the seller quality and things like that. 
and then go, go to the checkout page and see if, if there are any offers available which are run by the e-commerce website. So if you can see this visitor journey, there are basically three components within this visitor journey. First is the entry point into your funnel, which, which in this case is the category or the landing pages. And then the, 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 the design exit of offer visitor, which is the checkout or a conversion on this case. And then there's a third component, which is about around the product, which is basically what a visitor is doing on the website. So if you can visualize this visitor journey, what is trying to do is help you define your visitor's expectation right from coming into the entry point. The expectation of visitor is to either take an action or be aware about what what he's what what is what our particular thing is looking for. Another thing which uh, visitor journey helps you with is to visualize navigational roadblocks. As you can see, at at those junctions where a visitor ha either have to make a decision or to make a transition from one page to another, those are your areas where a visitor drop off the most. So a visitor journey kind of helps you in identifying those areas where where your visitor might be dropping off. And it could be for a number of reasons. Either if I'm jumping from the from the landing page from which I visited first on your website to, to the product page or to the listing page, there might be very little call to actions available or there might be too many call to actions available which kind of confuse the visitor to taking an action then there might be uh, areas of checking out on the on the card checkout page where either the the, the initial offer which i saw uh, while coming to your website is not available at the time of checkout so i which kind of confuses the visitor in terms of whether to take the next step or not another thing which uh, a visitor journey sketch kind of helps you with is to identify the area of improvement. So maybe if you can observe this particular visitor journey, whenever a visitor might be confused in terms of making a purchase or selecting a particular product, reviews and ratings kind of works as a nudge in terms of taking the next step. Similarly, when a visitor is either at the checkout page, then uh, something like a coupon code or a, a free shipping de delivery kind of acts as a nudge of taking the next step. So with enough context about a visitor journey and breaking your visitor journey into multiple components so that you guys can sketch it better, let's do an activity. I would request you guys to take a pen and paper and try to draw one of the many visitor journeys which a visitor can have on your website. It could be anything. Uh, taking an inst instance of the VW's website, which is, which is, which is our website, so maybe somebody who is doing an organic search might be looking for an A-B testing tool, uh, does a research, uh, does a Google search on A-B testing, finds our website, lands our website page. Now this, now this visitor might be curious about knowing more about uh, what we have to offer, what we have to offer as an A-B testing tool. Then th that visitor might be might want to go to a product page, and then go to a few other feature pages and understand what we have to offer in terms of metrics and measurement and then maybe close on 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 the checkout which is a free trial demo or a demo request page in our case so what i want you guys to visualize is to build a start in the end point uh, all the visitor journeys would have at least two components the first component would be the entry point that how a visitor is getting inside your funnel and the second component would be how would be the designed exit or design conversion of, of your visitor. And between those, between those two points, the A and the B point, would be what your visitor is doing or experiencing or taking actions from reaching from point A to point B. So I want you guys to visualize it and kind of draw uh, one very simple journey, which kind of understands about how a particular visitor on your own website would behave from point A to point B. This this will kind of help us in building a curated uh, research blueprint for your for your business. So I'm assuming you guys are kind of uh, done done with this part. Uh, so let's try to understand uh, by taking an example in terms of how this visitor journey, which you have kind of sketched now, can help you guys. So once you have the visitor journey in front of you, 
be, I, I encourage you guys to go as wild as asking questions on that visitor journey at various junctions of that of that particular visitor journey. So one kind of questions could be starting with bots, which would be what products are your visitors looking for? What are the places of your website which a visitor who starts with your homepage or with an ad wants to reach out to? Another set of what questions would be what at what steps in the funnel are your visitor dropping off the most? These these points would be the junctions where the visitor has either need to take an action or needs to leap from one page to another or either has to make a decision in terms of purchasing, moving or dropping off. So the reason I've uh, broken down the questions which we need to ask from our, we need to look look into our uh, visitor journey and ask us ourselves are from the what and why perspective is because uh, what kind of questions, the questions we start with what are answered by quantitative research and the question we start with why are answered by qualitative research. So another set of why questions which you should definitely ask by looking at your visitor journey is uh, why are visitors bouncing off from your category page? Your category page could be the starting point of your visitor from entering your funnel. If people are bouncing off from that page, uh, one reason, one potential reason for that would be that either you are not listed your products or categories so well that it, it, it creates a navigational barrier for them to move on. Or there could be other issues like are there, there too much information there or there are too many links to click so that they are confused in terms of where to begin, the, begin their journey with. Another set of why questions which you should definitely ask by looking at your visitor journey are why are your visitors abandoning their carts? There's one example which I discussed that one reason could be that your offers are which you for for the offer which you they started their journey with it might be a thirty five dollar discount you started with on on a real estate purchase or or a real estate listing and once they reach out in terms of booking an appointment uh, there was no uh, recall of that particular offer and they feel kind of confused in terms of whether they'll be availing that thirty five dollar discount or not now after going wild with these what and why question by looking into your visitor journey you'll be able to address a lot of things first thing would be to segment your visitor journey into into multiple parts as we started with with this inception that uh, there's a starting point and the ending point of every visitor journey and there's a lot happening in between so you need to identify those segments those components within your visitor journey and i if i basically come down on drilling down on a user uh, research blue, uh, visitor research blueprint then it will look something like this yeah so basically what you need to start with is outlining your visitor journey where you'll start with defining your goals and funnels uh, like comprehensive example which we just discussed where we kind of bro broken down our visitor journey in terms of different components the starting point the end point and the area where your visitor is playing around the most. Then identifying the drop-off points. These points would be identified from your uh, Google Analytics data. Uh, there were metrics like the bounce off rate, the time spent on page, and where what are the areas your visitor is entering or exiting from. You need to identify those things on your visitor journey. Then asking as much as possible what and why questions within by visualizing your visitor journey sketch. These what and why questions will kind of be answered in the third step, which is addressing the what and whys by doing qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, some ways of uh, doing quanti quantitative research is, is, is through Google Analytics by analyzing their data. And some way of doing qualitative research is basically to reach out to your customers, your, your repeated visitors and users, and giving them tasks and assignments in terms of finding different action items or areas on your website. If they are able to do that at a, at a average user's time or at an average user's pace, then they might those might be not the areas where you should focus on. But you should definitely focus on areas where a difficult 
where, where a visitor or a customer is difficult to take an action from. So these will be the areas how you'll address your what and why's. And ultimately, to build strong hypotheses from the data you collect from these what and why's and put into action in terms of experimenting, running experiments around it. So one form of experiment would be as simple as once you've identified that, you know, this is the component of your visitor journey. It might be on the on, on the starting phase where people are coming to your category pages and seeing the drop off. So it's best if you uh, run one one component of experience first instead of uh, running experiments throughout your uh, throughout different components of your visitor journey, because it's best if you test one component first, see if there's enough impact uh, available or is there more scope of running more experiments and then move on. So this will also kind of help you in building cadence in terms of building an experimentation roadmap. And yeah, that's how you build a research group. Uh, so to all the folks who kind of uh, invested time in terms of sketching the visitor journey for their business, I would request if they can you know, take a picture of that and post it on Twitter. And you can even tag VWO with the hashtag uh, visitor journey and would love to retweet it for you so now uh, let's jump uh, into let's deep dive into some actionable insight with brain shark and learn how they cut guesswork around their visitor research erica over to you awesome thank you so much hi everybody i am erica schroeder the webmaster web manager at brain shark um, we're located just outside boston for anybody in the us um, today, I want to talk a little bit about our website and how we have optimized for conversions um, using a variety of the BWO tools. Now, our website, uh, first and foremost, is a demand generation tool. Um, and here at BrainShark, uh, we use this tool because we're a B2B SaaS company that's targeting US-based, mid-market, and enterprise-level accounts. Um, so we don't have a, a traditional e-commerce sales funnel where a user would land on the website, uh, go through some category pages, and then finally get to a cart. Instead, we're trying to get uh, different contact information for potential leads um, so we can talk to them about our awesome software here and seeing if we can work with them and help make their lives better. Um, we've discovered over the past couple of years that our corporate website is by far our highest producer of qualified leads. Um, it, it surpasses any other marketing tool that we have. So we've decided to put a lot more focus into it recently in the last year or two. Um, we've since moved all of our gated content. We have things like eBooks, white papers, um, on-demand webinars. We've moved all of that onto our website and we've chosen to gate that content so we can hopefully get leads from that content and everything is behind a Marketo form. Um, so we utilize the Marketo integration in connection with Salesforce um, and that's how we've been able to track the general success of all of our campaigns. Now what we've noticed um, is that we have two top performing pages on the site that far surpass anything else, any other asset in the BrainShark ecosystem. One of those top performing pages is our SIA demo, and the other is contact sales. Essentially, it's the same concept. A user lands on these pages, they fill out a Marketo form, um, and these two pages provide more qualified leads than anything else. Um, so we know that, that these users are likely to convert at some point um, and eventually become customers. We know that because again, our Salesforce campaign reporting showed us that. Salesforce wasn't able to provide us any additional user insight on their behavior on these particular pages. So the number one question we've been asking ourselves is, you know, these are really top performing pages. They do so much for us, but is there anything that we can do to get them to produce even more qualified leads? Because if we can get them to perform better, let's get them to perform better. The tough part about that though, is that we've already done a lot. In Q4 2017, we did an overhaul of both of those pages. They look significantly different than they did before. Um, we removed steps in our user flow because we found that you know, users were falling off in certain parts out of our funnel. We moved the forms up higher on the page so that they weren't buried at the bottom. Uh, we implemented a contrasting button color to draw attention to that button on the Marketo form that we really want the users to click on. 
we also removed a bunch of unnecessary fields from the forms themselves uh, because we all know less fields is usually better and we changed the messaging on the pages so with so much done we were a little stumped for a bit uh, trying to figure out what else we could do that's where we got the idea you know what it's time it's time to actually sit down and investigate what the users are doing on those pages we really wanted to identify any distractions and see if they were hesitating at any point and then we'd like to eliminate both of those that's where heat maps and form analytics came into place for us. So our heat maps and our form analytics, we really look at these as the gold mines of user information. Um, so we can see heat maps here. We have that see a demo form. And ultimately, we want the users to click on that button on the Marketo field or on the Marketo form that says watch now. And you can see based on our heat map, they are clicking there. They're absolutely clicking there. It's one of the most clicked things on the page. However, we noticed they are also clicking on a button up in our sub navigation that says see a demo and they're also clicking on something in our footer navigation that says check it out see a demo now that button and that footer navigation item are site-wide elements they are on every single page across the site and at this point we hadn't realized you know maybe those are actually distracting users from just filling out the form they're still trying to get to the demo they don't really realize if they fill out the form that's where they're going to go they're just reloading the page over and over and over so we decided our next step let's do a round of a b testing and see if our hypothesis is correct will we get an increase in conversions if we remove those two elements that we now deem as distractions so you can see on the left hand side here this is our control it has two buttons up in our sub navigation and then it has two elements just above our footer and with our a b test we created just one variation here to remove the button from the sub navigation and to remove that second element from the footer and our goal was you know let's see if we get an increase in increase in conversions because now we've eliminated those two distracting elements on that page now what we found when our a b test concluded is that our hypothesis was correct that removing those two distracting elements will increase conversions on the page so when we logged into our tool uh, with VWO, we could easily see here, we have a smart decision. Um, it indicates which, which version, the control or the variation is recommended. Um, and we can see data down below on the screen, which is all very helpful in you know, going towards making informed decisions using data. And so as we move forward, we're gonna be taking that recommendation and we're gonna remove both the demo button from the sub nav and the footer, only on that page just to eliminate that confusion from the users. What's critical here is having this data allows us to have a more informed conversation with some of the stakeholders in the company. Sometimes those conversations can be a little bit challenging, um, but when you have data like this to back it up, it does make it a little bit easier. Now, the other thing we looked at on those pages, both CIA demo and contact sales, is our form analytics. Um, form analytics is, such a useful tool for us uh, because we can quickly see and track the conversion rate over time and you can also go back and you know change the date fields to get a real sense of well we made a change on this date you know what was it before that what was it after that and let's really see you know the kind of difference that this is making it allows you to identify fields that users are dropping on um, and what they're hesitating on and we can then use that discussion or that data again to have better discussions with our stakeholders regarding which fields we keep on a form and which ones we remove so what we saw in our forms is that we have some hesitation time particularly around our estimated revenue fields um, this is already a drop down field this is not a, you know an a free text field or anything like that it, it's already giving the users choices but clearly they're having a little bit of hesitation here they're getting stumped on this one and you know frankly as a user myself I can understand that that could be a point of hesitation for them um, however you know when it comes to talking to our sales team and our sales reps they love to have as much data as possible from these forms that we have on our sites so that when they're talking to these prospects they're a little bit better informed so in their opinion the more fields we can have the better but again if this field is causing some hesitation time and we want to increase conversions our best bet might be to remove it altogether so moving forward what we're talking about doing now is a b testing what happens if we remove that field and you know getting ourselves some actual data to confirm that that's going to be a good choice for us so i think just to sum up 
um, what we've found here is that all the data that we get from these different tests and these different um, heat maps and all of the other things that are available to us in VWO have really made conversations with stakeholders easier. I'm gonna see if I can forward the slide. I am having a bit of an issue doing that right now. There we go. Um, so I'm sure that everybody on the, the call also has you know, similar issues. You have lots of different stakeholders and everybody has a different agenda and a different goal. Our salespeople want qualified leads. The demand gen team really wants conversions. Our designers want everything to be beautiful and gorgeous and pixel perfect. The UX team wants users to have a good experience and the web developers really just want it to work. So that conversation can go in various directions and it can be hard to get everybody moving in the same direction, moving towards the same goal. But if you have the data to back you up, we found that it makes that conversation a lot easier. So everything that we've done um, thus far has been just really helpful in getting our conversions increasing. And we're looking forward to finding new ways to use the tool in the future. Uh, with that, I would like to pass it over to Pablo from Quandu so we can hear about all of the awesome stuff they are doing. Thanks a lot, Erica. And hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today here. Uh, as, I, as we mentioned, uh, my name is Pablo. I'm the senior product owner for search and book at uh, Quandu. And let me try here. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, today, Second, yeah. Uh, today I'm going to be telling you a bit about our A-B testing process, sharing you some examples, and first of all, explaining you a bit more uh, to those who joined in the middle of the webinar session, uh, what is Quandu. So uh, Quandu is a platform that provides a B2B services for restaurants to manage their reservations and seating plan, and also allows consumers via our B2C products, uh, responsive website and iOS and Android app, to search for restaurants and make reservations online. Uh, consumers can also review their dining experience and manage the reservations. Uh, we, we're basically uh, a global company present uh, with operations in 12 countries, market leader in, in some of them, and, and we're growing the market share in the rest, thanks to our more than 370 employees worldwide. Uh, I would also like to point out one of the big milestones that we've achieved this year, which is basically surpassing the 100 million seated, seated diners uh, milestone, which uh, we're very really proud of. And we're already far from that, but uh, just wanted to make sure uh, that uh, we point that out. So today, um, well, today I will be sharing with you how we do data-driven A-B testing at Quandu and more specifically uh, how we use VWO's uh, conversion rate optimization platform to improve the conversion rate in our consumer products specifically. So yeah, the starting point uh, in our A-B test cycle is uh, always to get as many insights as we can from our users. Um, understanding how they interact with our site, what problems are they facing, what are their needs? Is it crucial to set uh, um, certain questions? So um, we need to collect all those insights to make sure that we are focusing our efforts in the right direction. And we will generally start by asking ourselves two questions, right? So where are we going to have the biggest impact? And uh, what is going to bring additional value to our users? Um, there are several ways to find answers to these questions, uh, but in our case, we start off uh, by looking into funnels and visitor flows in Google Analytics, and we narrowed it down to the three most popular flows where we could basically have the biggest impact. Uh, the first flow, okay, one second. Yeah, one of the most popular flows uh, starts with users who know the um, who know Quandu actually, and they land uh, in our homepage, and they want to basically search for restaurants in a specific destination. Uh, afterwards, they will find the restaurant that they're interested in. They will see, they will look at certain information. And then they will uh, provide their reservation uh, details, the contact information, and voila, they have a, 
uh, than a reservation. That's one of the uh, popular flows. The second or one of the other uh, popular flows is uh, users who actually know uh, where do they want to go for uh, for dining out, uh, but they are still not sure what restaurant, so they will basically land on uh, the results page. They will find the restaurant they are interested in, and uh, after providing the same reservation details and contact, uh, they've done a reservation. Now, the third uh, popular flow, uh, as you can guess, is another use case where users actually know the restaurant that they want to go to. In that case, they will land on the restaurant detail page and then they will proceed with reservation and so on. So what we know at this point is that uh, we can narrow down the focus of our A-B test uh, efforts to a specific set of pages, which I highlighted in bold here at the bottom. That is the restaurant detail page, the booking widget and the checkout form. Um, those pages seem to appear in all of our uh, popular flows. Now, once we've identified uh, where uh, are we going to have the biggest uh, opportunity, the next step is to dig deeper into what exactly can be improved. Uh, for that, we actually use several tools that VWO provides. Uh, for starters, uh, here you can see that we set up uh, surveys and we ask two types of questions. Uh, asking broad questions uh, to our visitors uh, this allows us to basically understand better what their goal is in using our product. Uh, and this is useful to identify areas of opportunity. Now, secondly, uh, we will continue collecting qualitative feedback in a more quantitative way by narrowing down our questions into multiple options. So here we don't give them the, the option to uh, write uh, free text, but it's mostly us asking them a question and giving them a set of options. And uh, this is actually very useful uh, to support more concrete hypotheses. Yeah. Along with that, we will also create uh, heat maps, uh, scroll maps, form analysis, and recordings uh, to gain more insights. So these are running constantly. And as Erica pointed out, they are very useful to constantly collect data and then you can go back into dates and see what was in that time range when the feature looked this way, what were the numbers uh, uh, after a certain time range and so on. So uh, I just want to point out one thing here that uh, something that we find particularly useful are actually the recordings. So generally recordings, recordings seem to be uh, take a bit more of time for, for everyone to look at, uh, but uh, what we've discovered uh, is that by maybe dedicating like at least one hour a week uh, to go through a set of recordings, we've really encountered and we've discovered some really interesting patterns and as well as some issues that our visitors were facing. Uh, so yeah, visitor recordings is uh, one of the great insight uh, tools. Um, Another tip that I would like to share here is that when you start uh, testing, um, we found from our personal experience that tracking as many uh, things, as many goals as you uh, can possibly do will give you really, really good insights uh, for setting up the first paint and understanding better the users. Uh, and it will also help you identify great areas of improvements. Uh, as I pointed out here, make sure always your important elements are the most clicked and they appear on top and secondary elements uh, that you are thinking of maybe removing, uh, make sure they are down. So um, without, uh, now let's look at um, how those insights actually help us create some successful A-B test. Um, one second. In the first example here, uh, we used surveys, uh, click maps, and recordings uh, to find out that actually menu in our restaurant pages is one of the most important pieces of information that our users request. Um, that was clear from all those insights, but we still had in the surveys uh, some users telling us that they could not find the menu. 
So after some discussions, we thought that maybe some, using, some users were actually missing the word menu in the menu section page, and I will tell you why. So previously, our menu was called Chef's Choice. So therefore, we decided to actually test uh, changing the wording from Chef's Choice uh, to Menu Highlights. And this particular change uh, actually gave us a relative increase in conversion rate of 1.8% uh, in the reservation conversion. So the big learning here was make sure you speak the language of your users. This specific test was fairly simple to do, but without the insights we gained from uh, surveys and from the visitor, uh, the click, click maps and so on would not have been uh, possible. Um, Another example, uh, in this case, form analysis uh, on the checkout form, uh, which was running for uh, quite a bit, revealed that many visitors uh, who engaged with the form uh, got stuck in the prefix field. So initially, we assumed that actually everyone knows their prefix, right? So if I'm living in Germany, my prefix number is plus 41. But Actually, we might have been too optimistic about this. Uh, so we decided to add a bit more information to the prefix. And in addition to the prefix, uh, we decided to add the, a country flag uh, and the full country name when opening the prefix dropdown uh, to provide more uh, information to our visitors. And this actually led to a big uh, increase in our checkout conversion rate, actually a 4.6% uh, relative increase. Um, and a big gain thanks to tools uh, such as the form analysis. Um, and one more example I would like to share with you today here. Uh, in this case, uh, on the checkout form, uh, the click maps actually showed us more clicks on the single sign on options, basically on the and uh, Facebook Connect uh, options. Uh, basically, uh, also the scroll maps showed that not all the visitors had a clear uh, understanding of how long the form was going to be. In this case, you can see that the mandatory fields which are required, email address, first name, last name, prefix, and phone number, seem to have more behind them, which is actually not the case. So. Uh, we, we, we were thinking that, okay, um, what can we do about this? So we decided to switch uh, the order and place all the mandatory fields uh, on top so that all visitors to checkout uh, who were not logged in could actually see the, the form directly and see that it's actually not longer than what the viewport displays. And well, the result was an increase of 0.8% relative on the checkout form. And finally, uh, just to wrap this up, I would like to share with you some numbers uh, for this past uh, one year since we started uh, A-B testing at Quandu uh, together with VWO. And uh, these numbers are signifying each one of these things. So for example, 10. Uh, 10 is actually the A-B tests that were running simultaneously at some point in our site in this past year. 15.3% is the relative increase in the average conversion rate from the second half of last year uh, to this uh, first half of the year. Uh, we've also uh, pretty much doubled uh, by increasing 101% uh, the number of A-B tests that we ran in the first half of uh, this year versus the second half of last year. Uh, and A-B test, uh, A-B speed is the metric that we use basically to measure the, the velocity of how many tests uh, do we run in a specific time frame, yeah? And 151%, uh, which is actually the growth in A-B effectiveness, which is basically the ratio of successful A-B tests uh, to total number of tests. And as you can imagine, only measuring A-B speed without bearing in mind how effective your tests are makes no sense. So that's why we find very, very important to combine both of these KPIs to actually improve our A-B testing process. 
And just to finalize, uh, we've nearly tripled the amount of team members involved in uh, the A-B testing process. So if you're thinking of uh, joining Kwandu, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And that's all from my side. Thanks a lot. That's our, those are some amazing number, Pablo. And we, as part of the VW team, uh, take some amount of proud in terms of you know being a part of your journey in terms of reaching those numbers so guys uh, i am opening up the q a session for for all the speakers and the attendees to ask questions now so we have already started getting some questions already uh, the first question which we have is uh, from john he has a question around uh, when setting up a cro ab testing process do businesses have a template or checklist of micro macro goals to track within Google Analytics? Uh, I think uh, about goals and funnels was discussed by Rahul. Rahul, would you be uh, able to take this question up? Uh, sure, Utkarsh, I'll take this question up. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's actually a very valid question. And, you know, as we've discussed uh, during our webinar, that it's really important to actually, uh, you know, design your user journey as Kush talked about so you know taking an example of an e-commerce wherein you know if you're defining the entire user journey it starts from a visitor coming to a product page or maybe a home page searching for a product and then you know getting to the product category page and then finally adding the product to the cart and then checking out so in such in this particular example you know um, a macro goal would be users checking out and buying the product and all the micro goals would be starting from uh, person entering the home page, then person searching for a product, a cart page. So all these are micro, micro goals. So there is definitely the fixed template would be to design your user journey first, and then you know setting up all the micro goal that leads to your main business goal that you want to achieve. It could be increasing in revenue. So again, you know, giving another example of VW itself. So for us, you know, uh, the macro goal would be user signing up. So you know to lead to that. A user has to, you know, search for our product, come to our home page, and click on sign up, fill this up, fill the uh, sign up form, and then click on submit. So, in order to make the user submit the form, we have to optimize the entire sort of journey. So, for that, you know, we have to optimize all the micro goals, which is clicking on the CTA, which leads to the form, and improving that sort of home page experience. So, for every business, there are different sort of uh, templates. But broadly, you know, defining the user journey would really help you define all your micro goals and macro goals that you want to track. I hope that answers the question. I think it does uh, perfectly. So uh, another question is coming up from Stephen Graf. Uh, Stephen has particularly uh, wanted to ask a question to Erica. He's asking that is the sales team measuring lead quality for the two different variants? Uh, I don't know which variant is Stephen talking about here, but maybe Erica, you can start by discussing a little bit about is the sales team measuring lead qualities. Sure, absolutely. Um, actually, at BrainShark, a lot of our lead qualification scoring happens within the demand generation team itself, um, and that is, you know, there's different uh, things that we've done over the past year to kind of change how we qualify leads. Um, basically, some of our regular ebooks and assets uh, have a lower qualification score than our uh, than our users who come through the site landing on that see a demo or contact sales page. Um, but that discussion happens between demand generation and the sales team on a regular ongoing basis. Um, so in terms of, of the information that we're getting, um, we've definitely come to a consensus between the two departments to make sure that they're getting enough information. Um, but the demand generation team itself uh, has a very robust system um, that's all built into Marketo actually that handles all of the uh, qualification scoring um, on its own automatically as they come in. Uh, Steven then clarifies variant means uh, the challenger variant and the control variant, so which I think you kind of covered in your answer. So another question which we are getting is from Maggie. Maggie asks us, how do you determine the flow of your users? Uh, Rahul, maybe you discussed about the user profiles. Maybe you can take this up. 
Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so Maggie, uh, determining the flow of your users is very important. Uh, and you know, the first step is I think to uh, mark all the entry points of your website and sort of, you know, uh, you should know that, you know, what kind of landing pages do you have? What are the most common sort of entry points that visitors have? And what kind of, you know, uh, flow that would lead to. So I think defining entry points would really help. And another thing that you can do is that, you know, in Google Analytics, they offer a feature called user flow, which actually, you know, really helps you uh, show all the uh, sort of flows that user have taken to reach to a particular goal. So all you need to do is to define the goal and then it will tell you, you know, what are the different sort of entry points that visitors have taken and what are the journeys to reach that goal. So I think uh, that should really help you. But uh, most importantly, it's important to decide that, you know, what are the entry points on the website? Yeah, so just to add on what uh, Rahul has shared, uh, basically, uh, we discussed the concept of, you know, sketching your visitor journey. So maybe uh, you can start by, you know, making a mock up of how your visitor should flow from your entry point, which could be your home page or could be somebody's bleeding from an ad ad site or maybe just clicking on your ad or maybe through a social media channel or something like that. So these could be your entry points and, you know, it's best if you design a, a design kind of a or a mock-up of a of your visitor journey on your own and maybe then uh, put it into action and then uh, maybe run these qualitative and quantitative research and in terms of identifying what are what are different areas and at all the junctions where your visitor is behaving differently while while interacting with your well-defined user journey and maybe then see that you know what are the actual uh, flow of your user whether you know uh, that they are falling for the psychological cues which you have kind of used in different sections or junctions of your uh, visitor journey or whether they are behaving differently so i, I would first request uh, or rec recommend maybe outlining a journey on your own in terms of what you want to offer to your visitor and then running uh, quantitative or qualitative research on it in terms of understanding what they are actually doing and then defining the actual flow of your users uh, another question which I, we are getting is from Keys Altos. Keys has a question for Pablo. He's asking, what is the size of your A-B testing team uh, to run and analyze all these test results which you shared? Well, uh, to run and analyze, uh, specifically for that set, uh, it's going to be around uh, five to six people. Who are involved in this part uh, there are more than in the implementation but to actually to analyze uh, it's going to be around five five to six another follow-up question is coming from other people uh, mehdi asked us that do you measure the a b test performance with your analytics report so maybe Pablo, you can start with it, and I would definitely want Erica to contribute to this question. If we measure, uh, excuse me, can you repeat again? Yeah, uh, Mehdi is asking, uh, do you measure the A/B test performance with your analytics report? Um, at the moment, we rely on VWO, and uh, we 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 have a constant KPI uh, in VWO that we rely on. Uh, we have a small integration with Google Analytics, and for some cases, we are able to track also goals uh, via Google Analytics, uh, but it's mainly done via the VWO editor. That's the same for us at BrainShark. We rely primarily on the VWO uh, reporting tools for us to give us the information that we need um, and use it as sort of like a supplement into our monthly metric reporting that comes out of Google Analytics. So I combine the two into one report to send out to the department. Awesome. 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 Uh, guys, getting a lot guys, of questions. Getting a lot of questions. But uh, I think we're already five minutes over the webinar time. I'll just take one more question, which is coming from Rock Johnson. He's asking, do you recommend running more than one A-B test simultaneously on a website? Can this distort the data? So maybe first Rahul can start with the answer, which basically coming from a A-B testing or a conversion optimization platform. And then maybe would want uh, 
uh, Erica and Pablo to share their experience of you know running experiments so far. Uh, Utkash, can you just repeat the question again, please? Yeah. So Rock Johnson has a question around uh, running more than one A/B test simultaneously on a website. He's asking, can this distort the data, or is it okay to run multiple A/B tests on the website? Okay. So uh, Rob, it's actually really okay to run multiple tests. It, actually, it's advisable to run multiple tests. The reason being that you know uh, uh, there's not just one area of your website that is supposed to be improved, right? If you have multiple hypotheses and if you have multiple tests running, it's always advisable. And in fact, you know, if I talk about a lot of other organizations, bigger organizations like you know Bookings.com, who are running like you know thousands of tests parallelly, right? So it does not really uh, matter that you know if you're running a single test or multiple tests. If you have uh, multiple hypotheses, every test has to be run. And uh, probably you know it's the audience that you need to decide as to you know which audience you need to show a certain variation to. And uh, that is where you know you need to do some planning as to you know uh, the same sort of visitors should not see two different sort of variations at the same time. So that is very important. But otherwise, I think it's really uh, advisable to run multiple sort of tests. Uh, Erica, what's your take on this one? Um, we currently have, I think, seven A-B tests running on the site. Um, however, I will I will clarify that we don't have multiple A-B tests running on the same page at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. We really focused in on one hypothesis per page and mm -hmm. are attacking it from that angle. Um, we found that just in-house, the conversation then becomes a lot easier and it's a lot cleaner to have with some of our other stakeholders. So I can really clarify that, you know, we're testing this particular button and this footer element here, um, but we're not gonna A-B test, you know, six or seven things on the same page at the same time here. It's just, it's a little bit easier for us to clarify, but we do have seven tests running right now throughout the site. Pablo, what's your take? Yeah, as Raul uh, pointed out, uh, you can also choose uh, how much audience is part of the of the test, right? So um, in that case, uh, for us particularly, we are actually running multiple A/B tests uh, on the same page for a hundred percent of the traffic, and the reason for it is because we're running our tests uh, every like for a two weeks cycle. So the first week is to make sure that we have data for a full business week because it's a Friday or a Saturday is different than a Monday. And the second week is to eliminate any global um, holidays that there might be on some countries. Um, and after those two weeks, basically we've got enough, uh, statistically we have enough numbers to support uh, the, the 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 variation whether it's a positive outcome or negative outcome because all the other tests will also be distributed uh, evenly throughout the uh, control and variation so the the real impact or difference that we will see at the end in the a b test is going to be caused by this specific change on this test awesome with that uh, we conclude our q a Erika, Pablo, and Rahul, thanks a lot for taking out the time to come here and share your experience with us. Thanks to all the attendees for attending this session. We are coming back again on July 30th to discuss different ways of leveraging behavior economics with conversion optimization. Don't miss that session, as the session will be packed with insights around buyers, psychology, and how you can leverage neuromarketing in improving your conversion rate. Till then, keep optimizing.